Queen's Lead Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Singleton. And as a child of the 80s, I'd love to say queens rule, but they don't. Queens lead. Being a queen means you are worthy to be a leader of people. The guests on our show do exactly that. They are leading the way in their businesses, families, and communities. They're taking their rightful place in the spotlight, leading and inspiring the developing queens in all of us. Welcome to the Queen's Lead Podcast. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Queen's Lead Podcast. Today, I am so excited to be talking to Leela Baker. This woman is making a really big impact in a very unique way. And I don't want to say anything else about it. I want her to tell you. So welcome Leela Baker to the show. Thank you for having me. Leela, tell, tell our guests what Nana's Closet is all about. Nana's Closet was designed to help grandparents that are raising their grandchildren. We offer clothes, shoes, beds, what, toys, pretty much whatever that a grandma would need to get started um, trying to start over again. Yeah. And so as you can hear, we are going to be talking about the hard stuff today. These are topics that not uh, that, that there's not enough attention shed on and not, not enough light put on because it is a prolific problem, grandparents raising their grandbabies. So talk to us about how this, this whole thing got started. Well, um, the whole thing got started in 2018. Well, 2017, we, we received our granddaughter. And then in, she was born addicted to heroin. And uh, we had it was either take her or she was going in the system. And we weren't going to allow that. Mm-hmm. So we, we became her guardians at five days old. Um, In 2018, I was on a support group just kind of reading what grandparents have, you know, other grandparents were complaining about. Not that we complain, but, you know, sometimes you get frustrated and you just need to know that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. And so um, she had mentioned that she received her grandson with just what he had on in his backpack because she received him straight from school. And at that moment, I felt God say, you have been blessed. You need to fill this need. And I was like, not me, (laughs) wrong girl. (laughs) No, no, back this truck up. No, not me, not for me. Not for me. I'm an introvert. I'm not doing that. You're crazy. And then it just kept weighing on me. And so I talked to my husband and he said, you know, whatever you feel God is leading you to do, you know, follow that. And I went to work. I've worked in, I used to work in ophthalmology for over 20 years. I worked, I was a technician for one of the leading neuro ophthalmologist in the world, um, wow. Dr. Brad Ferris. And uh, he said, well, Leela, if you're going to do that, you need a 501c3, you need this. And I said, whoa, what? Oh, what? you're barking <laughs> at me. I have yeah. no idea what you're saying to me. You're speaking Greek. And uh, he said, you know, these are just things that you need to become a charity. You need to, um, probably the best thing for you to do is talk to your pastor and see what he thinks. So messaged my pastor while I was at work and he messaged me back to come and talk to him and he said you know what why don't you go see if someone else is already doing this Mm -hmm. because if they are don't duplicate just volunteer to help them and I thought well heck yeah I'd rather volunteer than start a a new career yeah I searched and searched and searched and I googled my butt off and there was nobody that would do what we're doing I found a place called Sunbeam Family Services And they do help grandparents that are raising grandchildren, but in a different capacity. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I called the director over that uh, program, she said, oh, my God, we need you. We're not interested in doing that part, but we need you. We'll partner with you. Ah. And they and I thought, "Mm, well, I don't know. So I just kind of drug my feet for a little bit longer and then I called, you know, you look up how to start a 501c3 and it says, first off, you need a board before you can do anything. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I called family and friends and said, hey, Lamont, that's my husband, said Lamont's cooking. We, I have something to propose to you. Can you come into the house? And they all showed up. And um, so I talked to them about what we wanted to do and they all without hesitation said they're in and so that's how we kind of got started doing everything um I googled how to how to write a um report for the state can't remember what it's called right this second 
to get to to become to be not, noticed as a 501c3, and mm-hmm. then we have to go to the federal government to write you know your articles of incorporation to them. And so we did all of that, and by April of 2019, we were a 501c3, and we did it so fast. And I said, you know, I mean, obviously it's God. God said, this is what this is what I want you to do, and He opened every single door to get us there. And so I just tell Him every day, you know, this is your this is your program. This is what you want to do. Just guide me because I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just fumbling through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you have and doing it with an infant in your care. Yeah, she's four now. And tr- and when we started doing that, she was a ba- little, little bit baby. And, but she would go with us to do these deliveries. And you would think she was a little pro. So you would see her handing gifts over to the other children. And she just enjoyed it. And she still does. She likes to go. Yeah, I bet. I mean, she's she's around her peer group while you're around yours. Yes. What has it meant for you to to be the mom of an addict and 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 partner with other uh, um, other moms that are the grandparents raising these kids? It's hard. Um, my mentality is, you know, for a long time we beat ourselves up. We thought we thought, what did we do wrong? Yeah. How could we? You know, we've talked to our children over and over and over again, and our youngest one was the one that was like. You can't live life scared. You got to live life to the fullest. I'm going to do everything and anything that I want to do. And so when you you feel alone, but when you talk to those other grandparents, you can see that they were just like us. Mm -hmm. Tried really hard to guide your children. Tried really hard to make sure, you know, you knew where they were, who they were with, what they were doing. And so you just feel, I don't want to say vindicated that you were a good mom, but it just makes you feel like you're not alone. That yeah. you worked hard to make sure your children were good people and they made a bad choice that took them down a really bad path. And so, um, you know, as that parent, you live every day, you live with the three things on your mind every day. Is that her that they just said on the news, they found a body of a woman? Is that my daughter? So you wait on pins and needles to see you know, if it, you know, color, hair color, you know, the details that they can tell you about your child. So you wait for that. You wait for that phone call from, from the jail saying, Hey, I've been arrested. And then you pray that while they're in jail, that they say, Hey mom, I need to go to rehab. Can you help me? You pray for that every single day because you want to save them, but you can't. And you, you fight so hard to save them and you feel like a failure because that's your baby and you can't do anything to protect them you see them on the street and they're dwindling away into nothingness and you know that they are so close to death and you pray every day God please let her live please don't let me have to bury my baby sorry (laughs) I didn't expect to be bawling quite this much (laughs) for those of you listening on the just the audio apps um, we're both in pile of tears over here I I'm resonating with what you say so much because I myself am a recovering addict um, from alcohol and I could have very easily put my mother in the same position had I not made a change in my life and so I'm so grateful as the child in the situation for what you're doing. And, and, um, and I appreciate, um, the care that that goes into it. And, and I, I know I'm so, I'm sure it's so hard not to be angry sometimes and feel like that failure, but I love that you recognize that it's, it was my choice. It's your daughter's choice. And, and we do what we can, we control what we can. Right. So you're able to make such a difference in the life of your granddaughter now. Yes, she is the apple of her eye. She is so feisty. <laughs> she was just recently diagnosed with um, ODD, that's oppositional defiance disorder. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, that's directly due to her uh, being born addicted to heroin. 
mm-hmm. said it's a very big thing in the, in their group of children that are like that. Um, yeah. So, you know, I worry every day about her because she was born an addict. Mm-hmm. And so how is life going to look for her? So you're right. I do still get angry. I still have those moments where I'm like, how could she have done this to her? How could she have been so addicted to something that she forgot that she's carrying a child and that that she was affecting her child so in so many ways and our story is lucky that Evelyn was born full term she was born on her due date Mm. you don't hear that very much Mm -hmm. from an addict perspective but the doctor said that our daughter had walked so much because she didn't have a vehicle Mm -hmm. so she was walking everywhere to get her fix and that all that walking helped protect our granddaughter from being born early wow so we're grateful for that I mean it's weird to say but we are are grateful for that that you know she walked so much that Mm -hmm. she that Evelyn was saved in so many aspects she doesn't have Mm -hmm. any birth defects she doesn't have she's super smart she just has this anger and I know that her anger that she has the ODD I believe deep in my heart that it's from our daughter coming in and out of her life. You know, she was at her one-year-old birthday party high. She showed up high and passed out on the couch. Mm. And so, but I'm thankful to say that my daughter has been clean for two years. She has a one-year-old son Mm. that she's taking care of. You can definitely see the difference in the way that she treats Evelyn versus her son. Mm -hmm. Um, the bond, not that there's that, like, not like she hates one, loves the other. Of course. There's just that, there's just that different bond between Mm -hmm. the two kids because she didn't feel like Evelyn was real, I guess, while she was pregnant with her. And she said, didn't seem real until she heard her cry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we sent her to rehab right after Evelyn was born and we sent her to her seventh rehab just before we adopted and Mm. because we didn't know that it was going to stick we didn't think she was going to make that change but we said here's a one-way ticket to florida to go to rehab you're not coming home because we can't watch you we can't watch you die it's just hard yeah so when she's away it's not not that it's out of sight out of mind but it's not as hard to see her walking down the street a skeleton and you know that tomorrow you could see her laying there dead it's just it's heartbreaking and yeah. so I, we would just rather not know. Mm-hmm. And I, and some people may not resonate with that, but because not knowing is hard too, but seeing and watching them die is devastating. Yeah. And you have to have be to focused to- on the things you can control and the things you can make a difference with. And that constant worry of what if, what if, what if it, it, it just can consumes you. So I can totally see. So the seventh time, was that the charm? It, well, no. She uh, actually got kicked out. She had relapsed. Um, she relapsed. They took her back to inpatient. Then they, um, then she left. So mm-hmm. they considered her AWOL and discharged her. So, you know, at, addicts, it's always somebody else's fault. Mm-hmm. So she ended up at another rehab with a guy that she met there. And it was a volatile situation. Um they were throwing things at each other and hurting each other. And uh, then she left with him to New Jersey and had a baby with him. She lives with him now. It's not, you know, it's not ideal there, but they're making it work. He's not the, um, he's not the best person that we would hope for our child. And we'll just, but you can just have, we're just happy she's clean at this point. Yeah, that's and it. She will she will make her other choices, but hopefully they're the right choices. Yes. For her. Yes. Yes. Once she gets that sober mind, I can see where the relationship with the her newest child is is actually blossoming. That it takes such a sober mind to to be a present parent, which it, you just don't have the capacity for that when you're under the addiction. It, it's like nothing, nothing that you would normally do as a normal person. It, it's just a different, it's like you become a different person. Oh yeah, very much. Great, so, a great manipulator. Well, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah. 
the the drugs and alcohol make make people do things that um that, that wouldn't normally normally happen. <laughs> so um, exactly. So tell us more about Nana's Closet. So, I mean, obviously this is not a unique story. Unfortunately, it's so, so widespread uh, that grandparents are raising their grandkids. So the needs you're filling are clothing, shoes, Mm -hmm. bedding, the things that they come without, similar to foster care. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very similar to foster care. And the only difference is that that they get to stay with family. Yes. Um, and a lot of the, the between 20 to 22 percent of the grandparents that receive their grandchildren end up falling below poverty line mm-hmm. because they weren't planning for that. Yeah, they were. It was not part retired. of their retirement plan, right? Exactly. That's a fixed exactly. income situation. Yes. Yeah. And I know great grand great grandmas that are raising their children, great grandpas mm-hmm. that are raising their grandchildren, and it's 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 an epidemic that people don't want to talk about. Right. Um, in, in, I read in the Enid newspaper that it says 90,000 children in Oklahoma alone are being raised by their grandparents. That does not include wow. being raised by a sibling, an aunt, or an uncle. That's just grandparents alone that are being raised, that their children are being raised by grandparents. And wow. so, you know, we, we at first were mainly focused on grandparents that are raising their grandchildren and we have blossomed out to where now, you know, if it's a family member raising a family member, we help them because she, the, the sister could be 19. She's mm-hmm. not going to have the means to help get these kids taken care of. You know, it's hard enough trying to be the mom at that age. And right. so we, we now help anybody that's raising a family member. They, as long as they have custody of them, we, we will do it. Um, so we give them seven outfits, uh, twice a year, pair of shoes and then whatever else they need. Um, Mm -hmm. but we, and we just, we've been doing this out of our house for the last three, almost three and a half years. Yeah. And four storage units for pretty costly. Four storage units. Mm -hmm. And they're not little, they're big. They're enormous. Oh yeah. Yes. However, I think I, I heard recently that, that you've, you've formed a new partnership. Tell us about that. Well, we were approached from um, Putnam City United Methodist Church on 40th and MacArthur, 41st, mm-hmm. 41st and MacArthur. And um, they're get, letting us use an area in their church that where our kids can come and shop for themselves now, because that's the goal. Yes. These kids have no control over anything that's happening in their life. I mm-hmm. want to give them a little bit of control. I want them mm-hmm. to feel so proud of themselves. And I want to, you know, I'm, we're not going to help every child break the cycle, but if we can help 10, 15, 20, 30, 40%, then mm-hmm. we've made a big impact on our community. Yeah. And then we want to continue, you know, as much as we can to continue moving forward. Yes. I love that you're giving them that, that control to be able to choose something for themselves that they can be proud of, proud to wear to school and, you know, to not be seen as, oh, you know, that kid that living with their grandma now. I mean, kids are mean, kids talk, they know, they know so much more and our children don't share that with us. They so many times seem to just hide that, hide that shame and that pain. So that's beautiful. We, we are considered young grandparents where we received Evelyn when I was 42 Mm -hmm. and um, but there are so many grandparents that are not our age they're much older and you know they get teased who why is your grandma picking you up where's your mom where's your dad Mm -hmm. our our granddaughter thankfully at this point will probably won't have that because we are technically her parents and yeah. don't have all the gray going on. I mean, my husband, <laughs> my husband is letting his gray show, but I keep mine covered. <laughs> That's right. I know we're in the salon. <laughs> yeah, yes. Monday was mine. And so <laughs> he teases me about that, but I, I just, I'm like, I'm not ready to be that old. Yes. I'm a grandma, but I am not ready to look like it. <laughs> oh, and I'm sure Evelyn's keeping you plenty young and on your toes. <laughs> oh yes. Yes, she is. She <laughs> is very much on our toes. What do you think? I mean, obviously you have a very unique perspective from the, you know, parent side of, of the addict. What do you think it's going to take? 
what does it take to make actual change? Decades, for decades, our country has been fighting the war on drugs. They've been doing all these things and programs and things, and it doesn't seem to be making a difference. What is your perspective? As a, as a mom of an addict my, and a heroin addict at that, my perspective is going to be very unpopular. Um, Spit it. I want to hear it. <laughs> there needs to be more control at the border because my daughter in her, in her sobriety has told me that she directly received heroin from the Mexican cartel. There needs to be more accountability for who gets to come into this country. And, you know, that's not going to stop all of it, but when they can blatantly, the cartel can blatantly come into Oklahoma and give our children drugs, mm -hmm. that something needs to happen. The other thing that's going to be, a, well, a not unpopular with us, but a populist government is the government needs to stop taking money from the mental health area because so many of our kids have some kind of mental health issue that we didn't know that was going on mm -hmm. because they don't talk to us when they're teenagers. Mm -hmm. They don't tell us things. We found out just before, um, I'll get to that. We found out that our daughter was cutting her body. Mm -hmm. We found razor blades. We saw scars on her. She had started wearing long sleeve shirts and um, baggy clothes. And we, she had just been diagnosed with a rare type of muscular dystrophy. So oh, we wow. assumed that she was wearing those baggy clothes and long sleeves during the summer because she was ashamed of what her body looked like because it's mm -hmm. deterior it was deteriorating. Mm -hmm. And so we never once suspected that she was cutting herself. I just knew something wasn't right. And so I went to her room and I did the unthinkable. I I invaded her privacy and looked at her diary and it talked about how she was cutting herself, how she would watch herself bleed. And we got rid of everything that she could possibly think of cutting herself with out of our house. We hid our knives. We hid everything. So that way she had nothing to cut herself with. And she would always come home with something that she was able to cut herself with. Mm -hmm. And so we put her in counseling. And of course, that, that counselor said that we were too hovering, that we, that we were the problem because we were too controlling and trying to make sure she, that she didn't do wrong. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand how, this, how it's too controlling to ask the three W's, where, who, and why, where are you going? Mm -hmm. Who are you going with? You, you, that's, I think that that's being a good parent to, to, to know where your child's at. Yeah. Especially, especially nowadays, you never know what kind of mass shooting is going to happen and people and those people who need mental health also that is not available yeah. and so I when my daughter was 16 I we woke up that morning it was November 12th of 2013 I remember that day very well we got up I got up started getting ready she was laying in bed and didn't want to get out of bed and was just being defiant I called work and I said, I'm going to be late and I'm going to get this girl to school and then I will come in. She was very upset. She left the house in a huff. I was mad because she wasn't, because she was trying not to graduate. She didn't want to. And I said, you're not 18 until after graduation. Guess what? You're graduating. I'm not going to sign papers for you to drop out. Mm -hmm. So I made it down to Dean McGee, which is about a 30 minute drive from here on a good day. And um, I got there. I had a patient that had shown up. I hurried to grab my chart and go to the room and start plugging in the information in my computer to get to go get that patient and get started. And a coworker came in and said, "Leela, the school is on the phone." And I, all the way down the hallway, I said to myself, "What could she have possibly done in this thirty minutes since I've left her? Yeah. What possibly could have happened?" That she's gonna that she's already in trouble at school. Mm -hmm. I, the the front desk lady who I, she actually knows me because I went to school there at the same school. <laughs> she's like Leela, the principal wants to talk to you. And at the time, I was so upset at thinking, what the heck? That I didn't hear the panic in her voice. Mm. That on a normal day that you that you would have you know looking mm -hmm. back, you're like oh, I. I 
missed it because I was so upset about the whole day that had started already that morning. Yeah. And then the, the, the principal, the head principal of the school gets on the phone and he says, Leela, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but Megan has overdosed in the parking lot and she's been down for a very long time and she's not going to make it. Oh and I just sat there, you know, you see in movies where everything closes in and the hallway gets longer and you think that can't possibly be the way that really is, but that's exactly how it felt at that moment. Nothing else was happening. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't, couldn't even commun- comprehend what he was saying to me at first. Mm-hmm. And he just kept saying, she's not going to make it. She's been down for so long. She's not going to make it. And finally, I was able to muster up what hospital are you taking her to? Mm-hmm. And they said they were taking her to the South Medical Integris. Mm-hmm. And I said, I said, okay, I'm on my way. And I hung up and I sat there for a second because you're still trying to absorb that your daughter is, de- is probably dead. At this yeah. Time. And my husband was in Nevada for work. My parents both worked at the same place, but in different departments. Mm. I remember someone rubbing my back at work. I couldn't tell you who. And I just stood up, looked around, and I didn't see anything because it was just, you know, I was just blank. Yeah. And I said, I got to go. And I grabbed my stuff and I ran out of that building so fast that I, my boss didn't know. My doctor didn't know. Nobody knew what was happening. They just knew I got a phone call and I ran out of here. You drove yourself? I drove myself. I shouldn't have. Do you even I'm, remember driving? I can't imagine you would even remember that day. I, oh my I gosh. It, uh, I made it two blocks and I was getting ready to turn on the Lincoln. And I tried to call my husband, tried to call my mom, tried to call my dad. And my husband called me back when I made those two blocks. And as soon as I heard his voice, you I, lost it. Well, I lost it. Yeah. I shouldn't have killed yeah. myself. But I did. I drove myself to the hospital. I beat them to the hospital. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. And I'm just I'm like, she hasn't made it here yet. And I'm just thinking, is it because she's still down? What's happening? Yeah. So then I called my daughter and I called a friend and everybody kind of converged to the hospital. And it was, it was torture. I don't even remember how long we waited for them to show up. They arrive and they say, she's awake. And I thought, praise God, she's not dead. Yeah. And so I went to the back and, you know, I don't know anything about drugs, you know, how it affects you and things like that at this point. If she was the meanest person, what are you doing here? Oh, this is, you're making this too much. And I'm like, do you not understand that you almost died? You were you were down for so long that you almost died. They cut your clothes off of you. They, they knew everything about you at that point because they were able to see the cutting because, you know, she's exposed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just was so taken aback by her attitude that I just felt alone and what the hell is happening Mm -hmm. at, you know, you're, you're, you're lucky to be alive and you're treating your mom like this who has been devastated this whole time. Mm-hmm. And the doctor comes in and says, is there anything going on at home? And I said, well, obviously something's going wrong. Yeah. Something is not right. Mm-hmm. And she says, nope, nothing's wrong. He discharged us and didn't keep her. Seriously. So came home, brought her home, what? put her in bed. <laughs> put her in bed, let her kind of sleep it off. And then I started calling rehabs around. Yeah. Here. And every single one of them said, well, if the hospital didn't keep her, we're not going to keep her. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, are you freaking kidding me? They called me and said that she was down in the field for a long time. They didn't think she was going to survive. And each place, one after the other would say that. Then there was a place down by Griffin Memorial. I can't remember the name of it. Um, they said, you know what, bring her in and we'll do an assessment. And I said, well, that's more than anybody else has offered. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So me and my oldest daughter woke our youngest daughter up and said, come on, 
we're, we're going to go to the store is what I said. And then mm-hmm. she said she knew that I was going somewhere else because of how long it took to get there. And we got her there and they did their in- assessment, two hours, make three. And the nurse comes in and says, well, since the hospital didn't keep her, I'm not really apt to keep her either, but I don't make the choices. We have a doctor that makes that choice. So she went and talked to the doctor and by the grace of God, the doctor said, admit her mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. And so she got admitted and it was, it was tough because, you know, you can't see them every day. You can only come once a week and mm-hmm. at certain times. And then the bad news hit. She's 16 in the state of Oklahoma. You have the right choice at that age. So she was able to walk out after one week. She was able to decide right then and there if she wanted to stay in rehab to help herself. She told me, I need it. But I'm not going because it's all girls. I'm not doing it. And so wow. she didn't have to. So we brought her home. And then then what? What do you do? Yeah. You ground them from life, but that's not going to do anything. They still can get drugs wherever they want mm-hmm. and when they want. And there was a, a place uh, up the street from us that was uh, a privately owned um, convenience store. That mm-hmm. would sell those locos or whatever with the alcohol in them. She was getting uh-huh. that from them. They would sell them to her. She's 16. Wow. She looked 16. She did not look like an adult. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, she's tall. Don't get me wrong. She is tall, but that didn't matter. She's she's still a child. And why are you selling her this stuff? Well, then we found out that during the process, she had used K2 and that she had a seizure from it, foamed at the mouth, and then went out. Wow. The girl that she was with freaked out, went to the driver's side, tried to push her into the, the passenger side of the car because she was going to drive her down the street to my mother's house, who was at work, and leave her and the car there. So she wow. would have died if, that, if she would have been able to get her out of that chair. Mm-hmm. But listening to the process of how one person came out, another person went into the school and came out and went in. And then you're like, that is, I mean, it, it seems like just from the talk that that was before she start, actually got an ambulance sent her way that it had to be in at least 10 to 20, 30 minutes long because he, where she was parked, going in, coming out, running to the school. And it's just, I mean, it probably was less than that, but just listening to everything, it feels like that it was a long time that she was down and then that she was down how much longer when mm-hmm. an ambulance was there and you didn't keep her at the hospital yeah I mean if you you your hands are tied and they shouldn't be right so her mental health wasn't looked at her yeah I mean obviously she's cutting do you see those big scars all up and down her arm inside of her thigh on her chest I mean this child is cre- is screaming for help and yes. we are trying to help her as parents and we're not getting anywhere. No, yeah. one's we are not the experts. We have no idea what to do. It's so no you idea. feel so lost yes. and to be turned away over and over and over by everyone. I mean, the problem is our mental health and, and even, even to some extent, I think our regular health care. I know like that diagnosis sounds like a catalyst for some of the depression and the other anxiety and the things that, that set all this into motion. You know, what kind of level of support are we giving, um, just our regular medical diagnoses, right? You know, that, that requires a mental health evaluation. You receive a diagnosis that is life-changing. That's what started my, my addiction drinking. I was, you know, diagnosed with autoimmune diseases and lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. I was in so much pain. They put me on pain pills. They put me on antidepressants, antipsychotics, 25 different medications I was on at one point. And I decided to get rid of them because it was making me nuts. I was literally, you know, in a mental health place because of all the combination at one point, but then I was still in pain. So I picked up a bottle because that's legal. I didn't have any way to navigate my new diagnosis. The loss I felt because of that, the pain I was in because of that, there wasn't a good option. We, exactly. we need change. We need change. Big change. Big change. Big change. Yes. And I, I have actually spoken to some of the senators. I, I did do that once. And um, 
they were very touched by our story, but you know, being touched by the story and doing something about it are two different right. things. And that's right. what has come of that. They, they, these, they, they're still talking about taking more money away from mental health. Stop touching mental health. Why are we taking away from something that is so detrimental to our fa- our families? Mm-hmm. Why are we removing the help that we need as citizens? Insurance isn't going to cover that much. Mm-hmm. And they the cost to go there is astronomical. And so they, I mean, we're lucky. My husband has a good job and they covered the majority of her visits. Yeah, but there's other people out there that don't have that. Mm-hmm. They they are dependent upon the state to help them navigate and get through this. But that is going to help us with the homelessness. That is going to help us with addiction, incarceration rates. Incarcer- oh, oh yes, incarceration. Oklahoma rates. incarcerates number one. No, Oklahoma is number one in incarceration of females worldwide. Did you worldwide? Know? I'm going to, I'm going to educate you a little bit. I don't know if you know this. Please do educate, educate me and all of our guests. Let's hear our it. Guests. So I didn't know how people paid for drugs, especially those that don't have money. So what they do is they give you a grocery list. This is what I want for my baby. This is what shoes I want. This is what purse I want. This is what I want. And then your addict goes and steals it and takes it back for their drug. Mm. And so your addict, is going back to them, but they're the ones getting caught. The addict, they're not going to, they're not going to snitch on the drug dealer. Right. They're going to, and so they're the ones that go to jail. So this cycle, there's so, I mean, they're, the addict's mental health is so bad that they're going to go steal anything and everything. The day mm-hmm. that our granddaughter was born, our daughter with her husband were all over the internet. The police were looking for them because they had stolen bullets. They stolen bullets for an addict, for I mean, for the drug dealer. Mm. They, and she was big, fat, and pregnant. And as a parent that deals with children that are addicts or any other any kind of other thing, don't read what people say because it is heartbreaking to read what they say about your child and what they say about you. They don't know mm-hmm. you. They mm-hmm. don't know what you've been through and what you've tried to do and how much you've tried to help. No. They just know what they see and, oh, my God, you must be the biggest piece of shit parent because your child is doing this. Mm-hmm. Well, I have news for you. I'm not a piece of shit parent. I'm a parent that tried to help my daughter over and over again, and the system sucks. Right. And your daughter is not a piece of shit either. I don't no. care how many crimes that the addicts commit. I don't care what they steal, the prostitution, what it leads them down roads that uh, decisions that that a normal minded person would never make it forces them into choices that that they they truly people think oh well they're just an addict they're not making these choices they are not they they made one choice one time that led to all of the other choices that affected their life yes. but people don't um, people don't understand that addiction is a disease and it's a hereditary disease it goes from generation to generation and you don't know who's going to end up with that lottery ticket to become yeah. that addict. You don't know. Right. You know, we, my husband's side of the family have, have addicts. My side of the family, we have alcoholics, addicts. Combining the two, we talk to our kids. We try to educate our kids about everything, but you know, not me. Found out that our golden child daughter, the one that we thought never did anything wrong was the opposite. She just knew how to hide it. She had tried drugs. So, you know, you look at it, you go, why, why does she get to try drugs and still become a perfect citizen in, in the, in the world while our other daughter ended up suffering? Yeah. And, you know, when I look back at it and when I think about it, as I'm talking about it, this daughter, she does have some depression and things, but this daughter had way more. She's cutting herself. She's screaming for help. She's got a terrible diagnosis that a slow progressive muscle dystrophy that is lung involving that, you know, she's going to end up on oxygen. She just spiraled Mm -hmm. and became, and then tried and then tried again. And she said, then one day I just woke up an addict. I just didn't think that would happen to me. 
Yeah. And it's not that my daughter is a piece of shit. She's a good person. She's yes. a good mother. She just has some mental illness issues that she still to this day cannot afford to get taken care of. But thankfully, she's sober and she knows that she has these mental issues and that she tries, you know, she's on some support groups now and she just tries to to do it the best she can. But would she have been, would she be here in this state having so many uh, convictions from stealing? Had we been able to save her at 16, would we be in this boat if we would have been able to save her at 16? That's the big question. That will always question. haunt me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just don't know. There's don't so know. much that, that needs to change and be put into place, even in even in our schools. I think I was talking to someone this morning that she said, you know, I, I think that, that our schools should, should maybe institute meditation or self-awareness or get these kids some other avenue of, of a tool, put some more tools in their tool belt to, you know, we do the best we can as parents, you know, maybe they're in a church group, they, they're surrounded by these communities of people, but in our schools, are we teaching them how to live? Or are we just teaching them how to pass a test? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I That's mean, they true. spend most of their day there. Are, are we equipping our citizens? What is the purpose of our education system? Are we just trying to get them into a college to, for them to buy a degree? Or are we really trying to equip well-rounded, able citizens with a toolbox full of tools that they can use to navigate life when it happens? Because we're going to get that diagnosis. We're going to get offered drugs. We're going to have a glass of wine in front of us one day. And we don't know, like you said, are we the holder of that lottery ticket? We don't know. Don't know. What if we had some tools to pull from that we've been learning for decades, for the 12 years we sat in school? You know, what if there was access to mental health care that actually allowed, allowed people to learn and change and equip themselves? True. It's very true. I mean, and teachers like to lecture all through school. Kids come home with astronomical amount of, of studies to do after school. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing that? If you're a good teacher, you your child your students should not be coming home with, with that much homework. If you were a good teacher, you'd be able to help your students in class get their work done so they can come home and decompress. Yeah. Not sit there and do more and more work. Even mm -hmm. as an adult, you don't want to go to work and bring your work home with you. You want to come right. home and decompress. You don't want to think about work anymore. You want to veg out, you know, whatever it is that you do when you come home and try to relax. Mm -hmm. These kids need to be treated the same way. They should not have this much work. Yeah. Our kids don't need full-time jobs. They need to be equipped and taught and how to live, how exactly. to live and survive and thrive. I totally agree. Oh my gosh. I can't believe this time has gone by so quickly. <laughs> so tell us, tell us, a, tell us a success story. We've cried enough. Tell us a story about one of your clients that you've been able to help with these grandkids. Well, I can tell you a, a couple. Well, I have one grandmother that actually lives in, in the neighborhood adjacent to us. And she had uh, three grandsons that came to live with her and nothing. So had, I put it on Facebook. <clears throat> excuse me, put on Facebook that I needed beds, bedding. I needed everything for these kids. Mm -hmm. We caravaned over there, bunk beds, bedding. The, a lady donated brand new um, mattresses, brand spanking new, and their, their blankets, their sheets, and their um, pillows, all brand new. And we went over there with all of this, seven outfits for each kid, their shoes, and she broke down and cried because she didn't have anything to help her. So I'm a crier. So I try not to cry with her. I had to think about something else <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to cry with her. Yeah. I don't like people seeing me cry. I'm weird about that. But, um, and then another lady, um, just recently I took her, she has one granddaughter and she's had so much health issues recently, so many surgeries. And she said, I didn't have anything to give her for her birthday. And so I'm going to take all of this. And I'm going to wrap it and I'm going to give it to her. And I'll just go buy her a small cake. And I said, just let me know how they fit. 
we'll exchange it if we need to. Because yeah. you know what? It's not about us giving it to the kids and the kids don't need to know where that came from. Hmm. It's about how they feel from getting it. Yes. And if the grandma or grandpa need to use it as a present, then by George, do it. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Let's yeah. make these babies feel needed and wanted because they've been through so much and you know, suicide is prevalent right now. And it's a big thing with young yes. kids. Yes. And we need to make these kids feel loved and wanted. So that way we don't, we don't have to make these kids the population that's going to mur- that's going to hurt themselves, murder themselves. Yeah. So, or the grandparents, I mean, even in older age, look at Naomi Judd recently in the news. Oh yeah. I mean, these grandparents are not only dealing with this, but, but, but their own mental health as they're dealing with this and to be able to, to give that and not, not feel like they're receiving charity. Um, I love that you, that you do that privately and give them that grace to, to be able to offer it as something they're providing. That, yes. That's so important. It's a piece that it's a nuanced piece that, that is very important. I can imagine for, for them as well. Oh, yes. You know, you know, at the beginning of this, I used to take pictures with the families and, and then I thought, you know what? It's not about me. It's not about what we, I mean, it's not about what we're doing. It's just not. It's about us being the hands and feet of God and showing his grace and loving them and showing them that they are loved. And so, yes, I take their pictures. I'm not anywhere in the pictures anymore um, just because it's not about me and I don't want it to yeah. be about me. I want it to be about the work that we're doing and what it's all about. Yeah. Well, for me, it is all about you. I can't get over what you're doing and the service that you're providing to our community. Um, I would love to just see a Nana's Closet in every single city, state, and town nationwide. Have there been any plans to to kind of scale up and, and partner with other people? We have thought about it. We have been asked to move basically statewide, but since we're yeah. getting out of the house, it's impossible. Yeah. Um, but now, now we have one door open for a facility. Maybe another church will open their door so we can start moving around. I yes. have had calls from grandparents asking for us to be in Colorado, Florida. And I'm like, you know, I can't do that yet. Let us start here and then, you know, we'll ripple out. But right now we're doing what we can do because it's just yes. me and my husband, you know, one of us has to keep working. He let me quit to do this full time because it is a full time <laughs> job. Yeah. And so he he's doing it all I can't ask any more of him (laughs) so I you know when he's home he helps me when he's off work he helps me so much he is he is the best husband anybody could ask for and I think he's the best dad anybody could ask for too and Evelyn just adores him to the moon tonight they're doing taekwondo together to to (laughs) celebrate fathers and so in her class he will join her and she is she was so excited this morning that dad's going to be with her that's amazing. Oh my gosh. Oh, so how can we help? How can, what is the biggest need right now? What do you, what do you need? Well, my biggest need right now, and it's hard for me, this is my biggest Achilles heel is we need financial, don- you know, monetary donations. Um, we are 501c3. It is tax deductible. Um, but, you know, we get so many clothes from other people, granted, but then you get some that you're like, mm, this is not good enough for my babies. And that's mm-hmm. what I call these kids. They're, they're not good enough. Yeah. And it's not that I'm ungrateful, mm-hmm. but these children have been through so much that I'm not about to say, well, you're needy. So here you go. Yeah. It's got a stain or it's got a big hole where it shouldn't mm-hmm. be. Mm-hmm. I want to give them as close to new items as possible. New brand awesome. name stuff, especially as they're walking through the door of school. I mean, it doesn't hurt them to have a nice new pair of Nike tennis shoes. Okay. Oh, yes. You know what I mean? Like I'm with you on that. The, and, and it's, and sadly, it's a big deal. I had uh, one grandpa, uh, actually a teacher tell me that he had a student that was embarrassed because she didn't have the right phone that everybody else has. Cause he makes them put it in the door when they come in and mm. she refused. So he kept calling her out. Finally, they had a big meeting about it. And she said, I don't want them to make fun of me. I don't want to be treated bad because my phone isn't what everybody else's phone is supposed to be. I don't want these kids to have that problem. I want these kids to feel amazing. I want, cause they don't need to worry about what they're wearing. Let's let them be worrying about their education and how they're going to make that next step and do the right thing for themselves. So yeah. that that's a big deal for me. And so mm-hmm. us being able to, um, 
if I don't have the right size or and shoes are a big thing. So don't always get shoes that are worthy of the kids to be able to wear. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I do try to clean some up. I try to clean them, try to make them look good. And if they don't, then I don't keep them. We donate them to other charities that we know, mm-hmm. but it's, it's monetary is a big thing because it helps us not yeah. only buy them something new, but it makes sure that I have the right size for them. And yeah. That they, we can do it and give them their clothes in a timely manner. Mm-hmm. Um, and the more donations that we get in, the more that we can spread our wings and do more. I just talked to a lady about a grant because I don't know how to write grants. And for the small package, it was $6,000. For a small place like us, you might as well have said $6 million at that point. Mm-hmm. And so I know that that $6,000 is going to lead us to bigger things so we can continue to grow. But right now you're just in limbo when you think, I can't do that. I get, we'll, we'll just have to figure out something else and figure mm-hmm. out how we can do this for now. And we'll just table that until we can afford something to that effect mm-hmm. or, or until God opens that door for someone that wants to do it for us for free or, you know, whatever, whatever the plan is, we just have to be patient. It'll happen. Yeah. What's the $6,000? What is that again? The $6,000 is to pay for a private company to write um, a grant. Oh, for, us. for a grant writer to hire yes. someone to help you write right. grants. Okay. Yes. yes. And, and, and they will <clears throat> find leads for us. So they'll say, don't worry about these. These people are not, you know, worth your time. You're not going to get anything from them. These are the people that you should ask for grants from. Okay. And so yes. it is a good program, but again, $6,000. Yeah. So if you're listening, if you're our guest and you're listening and you know how to write grants and you want to serve and give, Get with Leela. You could uh, donate some time, help her write some grants and, and move this thing forward. Is there a place? Um, okay, tell us where we can find you online. Uh, uh, you can find us at nanascloset.okc.org. That's our website. Okay. Um, you can email me at nanascloset.okc at yahoo.com. And you can also visit us on our Facebook, which is Nana's Closet. Um, I don't think I have OKC on there. But it's Nana's Closet. You know, the back, this is background is what you'll Nana's see. Nana's Closet. So if you don't see this background, then it's not us. Because <laughs> you do yes. I mean, Nana's Closets are out there. That oh, okay. Do like so. clothing stores or something else. Yeah, yeah I can see that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. And is there a place for us to give donations on the website? Can we pay a donation yes, there? Or is there a GoFundMe? Or how do we give the money? There are three different ways that you can give on, and it's online. PayPal. Okay. Um, Venmo and I think Cash App is what we have. PayPal, Venmo, and Cash App. All Nana's Closet OKC? Yes. And if you go to our website, it's right there. You just click on the way you want to to donate, or it gives you our address and you can write a check and it goes to our PO box. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us today, Leela, and for sharing your heart and your history and, 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 shining a light on the hard things to talk about. This is hard to talk about. So thank you for sharing your story, the story of your daughter and Evelyn. And I am so blessed to know you and I can't wait to partner with you further and really see Nana's Closet take over and make a huge difference in the lives of these kids and grandparents raising these babies. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for being a queen that truly leads. <laughs>